You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. We are going to be tackling the topic of understanding what is in the meat, fish, and dairy that you are eating. So a lot of people have had a lot of questions lately surrounding whether they should be on more of a plant-based diet, whether they should be going vegan, whether they should be cutting meat out of their diet. What I want to do today is not tell you what to do. I do not want to tell you that meat is bad for you, that fish is bad for you, that eggs are bad for you, that dairy is bad for you. What I want to do today is to present a topic and have a discussion of how dangerous it can be, actually extremely dangerous, to be eating any type of meat that is not grass-fed or pasture-fed or local, as well as wild-caught-based fish. So let's go over that today. I'll talk a little bit about dairy because there's an enormous difference right now, and this is something that should be spoken about, between a grass-fed animal or a pasture-raised chicken or turkey versus something that has been fed grain or corn or Skittles or anything that these animals are being fed That's out of their natural diet. Here's why this matters. Because you truly are what you eat. And a lot about what I'm going to share with you right now on the show is going to shock you. But it is absolutely true and verified. And you can verify it yourself as well right online very, very simply. So I want to present to you today an argument from an unbiased perspective of why if you cannot get good quality local grass-fed or pasture-raised or wild-caught fish that you most likely don't want to be eating them at all. And here's why. I'm going to give you three to four main reasons why today. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to do what I suggest. I want you to make the right decision for you. So the first one is this. I'm going to be going over a few different types of toxins that are stored in animals based on the food they're eating. And I also want to share with you, it's why an animal that says it's organically fed does not mean that it's healthy for you. So for example, organic beef is not healthy. Organic chicken is not healthy. Organic eggs may or may not be healthy. Here's why. Organic just means that the animal, let's say it's a cow, most common, or chicken, most common for poultry, or eggs, right? So let's look at these things and and include dairy in that as well, right? Because the milk, the cow's milk is going to be coming from the same cow that brings to you that organic meat. Well, here's the thing. You can say that it's organic beef if that animal is fed organic food. Well, what's a cow meant to eat? No, it's meant to eat grass and greens, whatever's in the field. It's not meant to eat soy, certainly not. And it's not meant to eat corn. That This is a big issue because cows and a lot of animals are being fed, even organic eggs. Ask them what they're fed. Well, they're fed organic soy or organic corn. Sometimes they're fed organic flax seeds to raise the omega levels. But you have to understand is besides the flax seeds, we're not supposed to be giving these animals these types of foods. It makes them sick. And then when they live in these huge, massive corrals that range in anywhere from a couple thousand to potentially over a hundred thousand cows in one area and thousands of chicken in one tiny coop that never see the light of day and have their claws taken off and have their beaks taken off so they can't kill each other because obviously a dead animal is not good to them before it's ready to be brought in factory farms. So what we're looking at is animals in tight quarters where bacteria is everywhere, disease is everywhere. So what do the farmers do? These aren't your local farmers, by the way. These are massive industrial-based farms. But what do they do? 
Well, they put antibiotics in the feed. Why does this matter? Well, just a little while ago, just a couple years back, we knew that 50% of all antibiotics were for animals, livestock. Now, it's 80%. It's largely believed that 80%, and most of the stats today are coming from, if you're wondering where they're coming from, they're coming from the FDA's own website, the Food and Drug Administration, and they're coming from the World Health Organization. So World Health Organization be a, a governing body looking at the world, trying to bring them together to do right for people. So it's a, overall, it's a very good organization. But here's the thing. When you give antibiotics to all of these animals, just look at this. You are consuming whatever that animal consumed. Okay. So if they're eating all of this corn, I'm going to get back to that in a second, soy, et cetera, they're living in a toxic-based environment, they're consuming antibiotics, these animals become what's called antibiotic, or the, the bugs that they get, which means disease, are getting what's called antibiotic resistance. Well, here's a very scary research and statistic for you. And again, I'm not doing this to scare you, but you need to be presented with the truth because there's no way your local media or national media would ever say this because of the beef industry, because of the milk industry, which is declining every year anyways because people are choosing to go more plant-based milks and and nut-based milks, all those things. Well, let's get back to the research though. 80% are typically meant and being used for animals. Okay. Now, As we create these antibiotic-resistant superbugs through the use of antibiotics in animal feed, and we eat the meat from those animals, we end up getting those superbugs in our own bodies. And this is scary, because if they ever start to multiply, if it ever starts to get out of control, typical antibiotics that they feed to the animals are not going to work for us, because they've already mutated meaning these bugs, these pathogens have already changed to become resistant to typical antibiotics. Now, check this out. This is a direct quote. This is from the Environmental Working Group from Don Underaga. Consumers need to know about the potential contamination of the meat they eat so they can be vigilant about food safety, especially when cooking for children, pregnant women, older adults, and immunocompromised. It said the worst offenders, this is an EWG report, were ground turkey, pork chops, ground beef, chicken breast, chicken wings, and chicken thighs. And it also went on to state The Environmental Working Group recently finished a study, this is back in 2015, on antibiotic-resistant bacteria in meat, the meat that you eat, ground beef, pork chops, ground turkey, chicken. Okay, what did it find? Well, their report, again, at the Environmental Working Group, I'll link this one up. Okay, so just head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1404 for today's show notes and links. Here's the thing, in 2015, what do they find? Their report states that the superbugs were detected in nearly 80% of all of the meats sampled. So when you look at that, the odds are 8 out of 10 times you are going to get one of these bacteria in the meat that you are then putting in your body. But if you didn't think that was bad, check out this. Again, this goes for these organic foods as well. Organic eggs, organic chicken, organic beef, organic milk, it does not mean good for you. So I'll give you what's good for you at the end. But here's the thing. What they find on the corn that are fed to these animals is a specific type of mold contaminant. Again, we test for mold in our practice. It's a big issue. And here's the thing. It's a specific type of mold, and it's called funomonisins. And I can never pronounce that correctly. Funomonisins. That's the word. That's what I'm looking for. Funomonisins. And it's a type of contaminant that actually begins to grow on the corn in these big silos where it's kept. Now, what happens is we feed these to animals, feed them to chicken. We can put it in cow feed. It can be given to any animal. Why? Because corn is extremely cheap. If you saw the older documentary, King Corn, then you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Farmers lose money 
by creating corn, by growing corn. But they're subsidized by the government in order to do it. And then it's used for things like high fructose corn syrup. It's used for corn is actually then fed to animals, which seems kind of backwards because you could use those fields to simply allow the animals to graze on grass. But anyway, I digress. That'll be another day's show. So why am I talking about this in general? Well, what happens is when animals are exposed to this specific type of mold, it can actually have massive adverse side effects in the animals. And some of those are actually neurological diseases they found in horses. They found cancer leading to cancer in mice and potentially other necrotic-based issues, necrotic tissue in other animals such as chicken as well. So when we look at this, we say, okay, well, if it's leading to cancer in these animals, and this happens, by the way, all the time, if you know a local butcher, you talk with a local butcher, one of the things that you could ask them is, do you ever see cancer? Do you ever see tumors in these animals as you're butchering? And they will say, yes, and we try to cut it out. That's no exaggeration. But here's what they don't do at larger facilities. They just grind it all up. And I know that you don't want to hear that. And I know that it's pretty disturbing. But that's what happens. In that ground meat, everything gets ground up because nothing is going to go to waste. Why? Because it adds weight to the food and then they can charge that weight, right? But if you were to take out all the cartilage and all of those things, what would happen? Well, it weigh less and so the profits go down. So what happens is everything gets ground up. So now you could be eating, and most likely you have at some time eaten some cancerous-based tissue from these animals. Not ideal, right? Not something that you want to think about, but you need to be aware of this, and it's simply why I'm bringing it to your attention today. Not one of the more fun topics that I've talked about before, not one of the most uplifting, uh, but it's important that we teach this to our children, we teach this to our family, our coworkers, and those that uh, we simply want to get the message out to that we care for. I just want to give you one more, though, one more that's really important to me, because there's so many people, and I know we have more and more people who are looking to do detoxes, but we have to understand is that the fish, the dairy, the meat, the eggs... Inside of the fats of the animal, the fish, what you just think of the animal-based protein, the tissue, but we're talking about fat specifically. The more fat, the more of an ability to store toxins. Now, I want you to go back and listen to the previous podcast that I did on toxic fat, how toxins can increase fat. There are a few people out there, and again, I, I never worry about any comments or anything like that because I understand that. There are levels to this. And they're like, oh, toxins don't create body fat. But they just, they don't know. Like they haven't got there yet in their research and knowledge base. And that's okay. There are things that I have to get to as well. But here's the thing. As fat accumulates, toxins accumulate as well. Adipose tissue, fat is a really good place to store chemicals. And we have the research behind it. The more fat an animal has most likely the more toxins it is storing. I want to give you a couple of those right now. So one that we're talking about, and you may not have heard before, it's short, it's called POPs, P-O-P. Okay, so if you see that in your research when you're looking around, POPs stands for Persistent Organic Pollutants. Now you might say, oh, well, what does that mean? It's kind of confusing. Always start to break down these you know, larger anacronyms. Persistent organic pollutants. Well, what is it? Well, it's things from the environment that are pollutants, that are a toxin. And well, they're persistent, right? Well, that means it's hard to break down. And it accumulates and gets stored in the body. One specifically that we're talking about is dioxins. And dioxins can happen all the time from waste runoff, from typical consumer-based products, and they can end up in the ocean as well and absolutely be stored in far, well, fish and polluted oceans and all of that. So that, that's a big one for sure. And it is in the fats of meats as well. So I don't want you to think that it's only fish because it is in meat too. So something that you can look into is something called persistent organic pollutants. And why does this matter? Well, it throws off the immune system of humans as well. Does that mean that could have something to do with autoimmune issues? Potentially. Potentially. Something to look into. Well, what about developmental and cognitive issues with children? Yeah, it's been potentially shown for that as well. How about reproductive issues in men and women as well? Infertility. Yes. Same there. So the next person tells you there's no such thing as toxins and you don't need a detox, we have to be really careful. We have to be careful with that type of information because it simply means that that person yet 
just hasn't got to the level where they've found that out. And that's okay. Because although you do take toxicology in medical school, it doesn't teach you about this. It doesn't teach you about environmental toxins and how they're building up in your body to this degree. Toxicology more from a standpoint of you know typical poisons and things like that. Now, don't get me wrong. Volatile organic compounds and these types of things are mentioned in toxicology-based courses. But by the time you get to you know the real world, well, what are you doing? Like, What's the detox protocol for a medical doctor? There's not a lot unless it ends up affecting the kidneys. And then we do dialysis and other issues. But there's a lot we can do before that. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But just keep in mind that these things that in high enough concentrations can also cause cancer build up in the fatty tissues of animals. Okay. So it's been found in, this is again, this is from the World Health Organization, the WHO. We have an acronym for everything in health and wellness and, and medical. So here's the thing, in meat, in dairy, fish, and shellfish. Okay. It accumulates in the fat of those things. I'm sure you can include eggs in there as well, but that would be to be to look for for more research since it's not stated by the World Health Organization. So all they're saying is, well, try to limit your exposure, try to limit your exposure. And they did this. Almost 20 years ago, there was something called the Stockholm Convention. And it was supposed to be an international meeting of world leaders all over the world. 2001, I believe it was. And what they said is like, listen, we're not going to pollute the world anymore. We're not going to use chemicals that can get into our food system. Well, is it didn't really hold up. The practices are not being used today. They even said, you know, we're, we're going to go less on the chemicals. And I believe, uh, I'm trying to think, but I, I believe it was like in 2015, there was one of those acts repealed where they could just go back to their old ways. I'll see if I can find that for you. I'll put it in the literature and the show notes as well, where essentially the, the food or uh, food companies are so powerful, they're so big, they have such large lobbyists that they just go right in and just say, you know what, now we want to repeal this act. And so we can go back to doing the old way of business, which was more profitable. So those types of things are obviously very disturbing because it's us that are affected. Another one, um, we've talked about this before, I actually just talked about this a couple weeks ago in flame retardants. So many of us don't, aren't even aware that it's put on children's mattresses, and, and adult mattresses too, and it's sprayed on furniture, and you're exposed to it you know, when you're on an airplane seat, like on curtains, all of these different things. Well, flame retardants, one of those called, uh, and actually, let me just give you the show if I can find it right here. I believe it was on plastics on my Friday review last week. Episode 1393, I believe, was the one on just being careful of plastics. Well, here's the thing. They're called polybrominated diphenol ethers. You don't need to know what that means, but polybrominated diphenol ethers, PBDEs for short, again, another nice anacronym, these can accumulate. And they are found in animal-based tissue. But guess what? We eat them. And then it's in our body. So people are like, well, where are all these things coming from? They're coming from the food that you are eating. So now let's, let's say, okay, we talked about that. We know that it's very toxic to eat the flesh of an animal, the fat of an animal, because people are talking about, oh, let's eat more fatty meats. Let's eat more organ meats. Listen, I'm for that. That makes sense. Only from a healthier animal. Eating the organ meat from an unhealthier animal is almost worse, and I would say it is worse, than eating the flesh of that animal. And here's why. The more fat organ meats, the more stored toxins. So whenever we're giving advice to people as health professionals out there, let's take it up a notch. Let's make sure the advice that we're giving is for general population, unless you decide to go through every contraindication, right? Which you can't do on a 20-minute podcast or 30-minute podcast or even an hour. You can't give every reason why you would or would not do something. You have to try to give the best information for the general public. And yes, there's going to be 1% that it doesn't apply to. But here's what we need to do. You have to be very careful when we talk about these diets that are high in fat. That is coming from a good quality source. Because if not, it's going to be loaded with potential cancer-causing, immunodysfunctional, reproductive issues, cognitive issues, developmental issues in children. 
all of these things could be caused by known toxins we already know about that we know have been studied and they're harbored. They're basically stuffed away in the animal's fat. So they're not exposed to it. If you, again, if you listen to my previous podcast on toxic fat, you'll understand our body stores them away in the fat to keep them out of the bloodstream, to keep us safe. Well, guess what? We just ate the animal's toxins. Now we put it in our bloodstream. What's our body going to do? Well, it's going to try to store it somewhere safe too. Our adipose tissue gets what's going to swell our fat cells. Guess what happens? We look over fat. We look puffy. We look swollen. Our estrogen levels rise. Our inflammation levels rise. Our cortisol levels rise. And people are like, well, why is all this happening? Well, it's not one simple thing right? We need to detox. Yes, but then we need to look at the foods we're eating. So what do we do? What do we do? That's the question, right? People say, should I go vegan? Well, maybe, maybe not. It's actually difficult to be healthy on a strictly vegan diet. You need to know what you're doing. You need to be eating mainly plant-based foods and not processed foods. Notice, I didn't say mainly processed grains. I didn't say that. I didn't say hydrogenated oils. And I didn't say cereal because it's vegan-based. So what you need to do is be eating predominantly plants, veggies, and fruits. But here's the thing. You also have to understand that those fruits can be sprayed with pesticides, and those have to be organic. So let's let's make it easier, though, because I know that everybody's head's going to explode. Be like, I can't eat anything. And listen, I get that, but don't let that be your response. Okay, don't let it be your response because you can rise above that. What we want to do is if you eat meat, let's say red meat, okay, then you ideally would like to go for a lower fat. I know people are going to go crazy over that, but a lower fat based animal, less chance for toxins. Now, if you go with a full fat or fattier or organ tissue, okay, but get it at your local farmer's market. Get it before it's been chlorinated, radiated, sprayed to make it actually red so that it doesn't turn gray and that you know who you're buying from. That maybe you can even check out the farm that it actually is grass-fed uh, or green-fed, sometimes we're calling it, and grass-finished, not grain-finished, okay? And is that animal on antibiotics? So to a smaller farm, the answer is no, okay? Then if you're looking at, and then elk is a lower uh, fat one, or more of the game animals would be, bison would be another example, okay? So now let's move on to chicken or poultry. Not organic, no, 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 pastured pastured, and then ideally local. That'll be a great way to do it. Now, fish. Okay, we want wild caught fish. That's what we want. Now, it can be sustainable. It can be, oh, it can be a lot of things, but we want to make sure that it's in its natural environment. They're doing a lot of things in the ocean that I might be able to get behind. I might be able to support as long as those fish are raised in a sustainable way in their own natural environment. Okay? but it should be wild. Same with your fish oil. If you're taking fish oil, is it wild? We use wild Alaskan pollock, sustainable, wild, no toxins, tested, right? So we we do the work on that because I'm taking it myself. My girls are taking our fish oil, right? So of course, of course it has to be the best. What about eggs? Not organic eggs. It can be organic, yes, but it should say pastured. Pastured organic is okay, but it has to be pastured. We don't, we want to know what the feed is. Email the company. Hey, what's in your egg feed? Oh, it's um, a combination of soy, corn, and flax. I used to buy from this company. That's why I'm using that. Seven years ago, eight years ago, my mind was blown. I saw them at a trade show and they were showing off what they feed their animals. I'm like, ah, that's not, it's not what we want. It's not what we want. Better, but not what we want. We don't want that moldy corn. It's not what that animal is supposed to be fed the majority of. They would not have access to massive amounts of moldy corn. So, That is what we're talking about there. Dairy, eliminate it. Okay, I didn't say eliminate fish. I didn't say eliminate a little bit of meat. I didn't say eliminate, no, 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 no. You could do that if you wanted to, all right? That's up to you. Now, one thing before I get to to cow's milk, and I kind of gave it away already, but you want to make a smaller amount. So you don't want to be eating meat in massive amounts on a daily basis. It's just not a good idea. It honestly isn't. It's going to be difficult uh, to find the best source. And uh, again, now if you work with the practitioner and they say that's best for you, then good, listen to that practitioner. Yes, that, that could be okay. But you might be someone that does better with a little bit of animal protein, a little bit of poultry, a little bit of fish, eggs a couple times a week. You could do great with that. So it's not for me to say, 
do eat that or don't, but make it a small part of your diet. Protein in general, I mean, again, listen to my podcast on the Mountain Evans Against Meat. It wasn't just about meat. It was about the quantity of meat, okay? Quantity. Remember that as well. Quality and quantity, they both matter. There's no way, there's no way that humans would have been eating meat three times a day. There was just no way. That's how we were developed. No, with a 20-foot, no, no, with a 28-foot intestinal tract or a digestive tract. Okay, last part, cow's milk. Eliminate it. No benefit. No benefit at all, only downside. Yes, I could quote benefits with extracting the whey protein and helping with immunoglobulins. Listen, I listen, I, I, I get it. So small, so small compared to all the potential downsides. All the potential downsides. If you want to drink an animal-based milk, make it goat or make it cheap. Make it as a kefir. Make it as a yogurt. Make it as something that you actually would get a little bit more benefit from. Just again, as an adult, you are not going to get that massive benefit from milk. Now, again, on the flip side, more meat, more milk, they're anabolic. It's going to help you build more muscle. There's no doubt about it. But building muscle is not synonymous with health, with building health. It's just not. I did things to get to 200 pounds solid muscle that were not good for my health. They built my body bigger. But it broke it down. Or they broke it down even more, created more inflammation. So I want the best for you. That's the bottom line. This is unbiased information. I'm not for veganism. I'm not for paleo. I'm not for primal. I'm not for carnivore. I'm not for keto. I'm not for anything. I'm pro-people, and I just give you the information as fact, as it really exists, with no agenda. There's no diet plan to download that is promoting this or promoting that. And even if someone has that diet plan, then good for them. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that at all. They should promote it if it's all about health in the end. So that's what this is all about. I appreciate you. Hopefully you found some value in this. If it was helpful, if it was beneficial, please do feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it could serve. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.